If Overlord's lore and world building are what you like the most, then that's exactly what you're gonna get from this. Since the novel is such a densely packed story, the cut content doesn't really deal with much of the narrative, but instead covers the layers and layers of world enriching details. Things like Ainz's desire to create a utopia, along with the more subtle goings on of the Sorcerer Kingdom, will all be explored in a way that the anime couldn't quite show us. So let's begin our Season 4 of Overlord Cut content and take a look at everything the anime left out from the novels. Let's get started. Episode 40, Sorcerer Kingdom Einzul Gone, covering Chapter 1 of Volume 10 of the Light Novel. Starting things off with everyone's favorite succubus, we find out here that things have actually been quite busy for her. You see, with Nazarek now in control of an entire nation, Albeda was now responsible for finding the appropriate people to help manage it. Because a lot of the previous civil servants had fled back to the kingdom, many of the government posts were now left open. So it was Albedo's job to train some undead to fill those vacancies. Of course, the work was quite overwhelming right now, but Albedo knew that if she worked hard enough, she could eventually leave those undead to run the government on their own. That would be a true display of all she'd worked to accomplish. Now, Albedo wasn't sure what direction Ainz wanted to lead the Sorcerer Kingdom into, but she was positive she'd be able to make laws and policies that matched it. Like, if Ainz wanted to make all humans work for Nazarek as slaves, then Albedo would have no problem creating laws that enslaved humanity. She would just have to be a bit more careful with how they handled relationships with the neighboring countries. As much as she would have liked for that to be true, though. That was just as good a guess as any. You see, neither Albedo nor Demiurge had any clue as to what Ainz was planning for them. They even felt remorse for not being capable enough to fathom the total genius of his master plan. What Albedo did know for sure, though, was that there was something to their new sorcerer kingdom that was missing. It was as if a critical pillar of its foundation just wasn't there yet. Now, where we find ourselves at the beginning of the episode is the refurbished home of the former mayor of Arantel a place Ainz felt was necessary to rule from despite the Guardian's numerous warnings against it. So, it was after he got up to begin his day that his initial response to the maid was a little bit different. You see, rather than say anything polite at all, Ainz simply waved his hand and gestured for her to leave. It was a completely dismissive motion he knew to be borderline arrogant. The reason he went with it anyway though was because this was the type of attitude Nazarek seemed to prefer from him. According to a survey carried out by Hamske, pretty much every resident of Nazarek preferred to be treated like they were being dominated. They seemed to revel in the commanding nature of Ainz's person, even if Ainz didn't seem to enjoy it himself. So, in order to help himself play the role of king even better, Ainz would actually spend his spare time spying on Jerkniv. At least that way he had something else to reference other than the office he was always picturing. That, and he actually believed Jerkniv to be a model ruler one he wished to be able to discuss their kingly struggles with one day. Now, the reason Ainz brought up the idea of treating NPCs as his equal was because no longer did he think that any were going to betray him. So long as there were no more incidents and he continued to impress, the possibility of a revolt was completely zero. That being the case, Ainz was starting to think that perhaps they could change their lifestyle a bit. Not only would it free him from his strenuous days as the ruler, but perhaps it could also make things similar to how they were when he was with his guildmates. Of course, Ainz knew it was his duty to maintain the ideal image the NPCs wanted for him, but he couldn't help but want to interact in a way that wasn't master subordinate for once. Now, a quick thing to note about Ainz switching the two books here is that this was all just for the sake of appearances. You see, because the books he normally reads isn't one he deems worthy enough for a ruler, he always switches it out for one that's a lot more difficult, one with a longer and more elaborate title. That way, when the maids switch the sheets and inevitably move the book, they'll see that he's reading something worthy of his incomparable intellect. When we get to Ainz having his outfit chosen for him next, this was solely due to him not being confident in his own fashion choices. Sure, there was plenty of gear that he personally liked, but he couldn't risk wearing something that would cast doubt on his ruler status. Then, even if he did keep wearing the same outfit over and over again, that too would eventually cause damage to his reputation. So, by having Fifth choose what he was going to wear, not only did it set aside a scapegoat for if the outfit was terrible, but it was also the easiest way of managing this extremely crucial decision. Fast forward to right before Albedo's arrival, and that's when we get to an interesting thought from Ainz, one that was taking into account just how taxing all this work was. 
You see, every day right around the exact same time, Eins would start to feel gloomy knowing that there was work just ahead of him. It wasn't ever anything trivial or miscellaneous, but instead a constantly changing set of massive decisions that would always direct the bigger picture. His subordinates were always acting on the choices that were made in this room here. The reason Eins found it so particularly tough, though, was because the weight of such great responsibility brought with it considerable stress as well. There was just so much mental exhaustion and pressure, much more than he'd typically have from physical labor. Even so, Eins pushed forward ready to delegate most of his tasks to someone far more capable. If nothing else, he could at least assign duties to those whose strengths made them best suited for them. That's why he made sure to thoroughly review every document that passed by him. Even if those documents were filled with contradictions, triple negative sentences, and just abhorrent gaps in logic. When Eins went on to discuss the status of his kingdom's laws next, we find out that they've simply been using the already existing ones. Albedo felt that to force people into completely new ones would only lead to even more discontent. So, out of concern for the kingdom's overall peace, Albedo decided to truly consider the feelings of the humans living within it. A surprising choice that left even Eins a little shocked. Now, for a bit more context on Eins' orphanage plan, while Yuri Alpha's was on the right track, the core problem with hers was that it provided people the power to turn against him. Yes, a more educated workforce does provide a means to strengthen Nazarick, but at the same time that very knowledge would be the first weapon used to fight them. In fact, it's actually for that very reason why Carne Village is kept under such tight surveillance. Should Enri or Neferia make any significant discoveries, then Nazarick would be the only nation to capitalize on it. That was the value of information Eins had discovered from Idrisil. That's not to say that new technologies couldn't be shared, but it was absolutely imperative to limit just how far that information was spread. There was a fine balance that needed to be kept in order to maintain this monopoly of technology. That being the case, the idea for Eins's orphanage was simple. Don't teach any person more than what the average local knows, then only share new info with someone who shows significant promise. Then and only then would they be deemed as potential candidates to share in some greater knowledge. Once Aura and Mare showed up shortly after this, that's when we learned that this was every guardian stationed at Arantel currently. Shaltir was guarding Nazarick and helping with transportation, Kokutis was still in charge of overseeing the Lizardmen, then Demiurge was on special business in the Sacred Kingdom. So that left Albedo for her management skills over here, then the twins who had just finished building a fake Nazarick in the woodlands. Initially, this fake Nazarick was intended to keep the real Nazarick hidden, but after having given away the real tomb's position to the Emperor, Eins decided it was best to use it as a supply depot and evacuation site instead. With that now complete though, Aura was tasked with strengthening fake Nazarick's defenses and concealment, while Mari was to build a subterranean tomb at the outskirts of the city. This wasn't for any specific reason in particular, but it did make sure that no person's power was going to waste especially when that person was someone as useful as Mare. Now, a minor little tidbit that some of you might find interesting is a brief update on the three elves from the worker invasion. All three were given to Aura and Mare, mainly in hopes that they could help in their development. Just like how the twins seemed to yearn for a father figure here, it was only natural for Eins to assume that they'd want to be with some of their own kind as well. But contrary to how he thought they'd interact, the three elves were more of a nuisance since they'd just follow them around like maids. They didn't really provide that connection that Eins was hoping for. Setting that aside, the more pressing matter right now was how they were going to take care of the supply shortage. An additional factor that made resupplying a little difficult was the fact that the Sorcerer Kingdom couldn't just take it. Eins had prohibited all military might from being used on any of its neighboring countries. So, despite it being very much like taking candy from a baby, the idea itself was completely forbidden. Fortunately for Eins, though, Demiurge did already have a solution in progress, a form of harvest that would provide supplies for now. He didn't know what exactly this harvest consisted of, but he was sure that if Demiurge was the one to come up with it, then he definitely wouldn't have to worry about it. Another plan more closely related to Eins was the send-off of numerous slum dwellers to go and rebuild destroyed villages. With a whole team of Death Knights at their side, these homeless prone villagers were sent out to reclaim land destroyed by the Theocracy. The undead would assist with much of the labor, then within a year they were supposed to have reached a stable level of self-sufficiency. That's when Eins was hoping they'd be able to start producing harvests of their own. Now, the last topic covered during this conversation was the peculiar request of Albedo to go to the royal capital. 
a trip that Albedo had personally requested multiple different outfits for. In order for it to happen though, there was this whole plan that needed to be made so that Pandora's actor could take over for her. Remember, he was also responsible to play the role of Momon, the valiant adventurer manipulating the minds and hearts of the people to favor Ainz. So, if Albedo was gone and he was now in charge of logistics, then someone still needed to fill that role of hero. That being the case, Albedo decided it was best to have Momon leave the city as well. He would tell the people he was requested to patrol a different area, then head out after reinforcing the notion that they shouldn't cause any trouble. That way the people would remain docile and both Albedo and Ainz could continue working without worry. Now, to briefly touch on the scene with Hamske, the only things we missed were minor details on her title as the Wise King of the Forest, as well as some mention of a prototype armor that they were making for her. The title wasn't as fitting for her as Ainz initially thought it was, and she was ordered to continue her training with this prototype armor on now. Fast forward to the scene with Pandora's actor now, and that's when we find out an interesting aspect of one of his duties. Aside from his previous job as the caretaker of the treasury, Pandora's actor was also responsible for creating half of the undead in Nazarick. The other half were all made by Ainz himself, but the creations of PA were similar enough to pass as minions. Plus, even with both of them creating as many undead as they could, it would still be impossible to get through all the corpses that were kept frozen in the icy fifth floor's glaciers. An important line that was excluded from their conversation about growth was the immediate backpedaling Ainz had to do to ensure that he wasn't playing favorites. So, in order to put Pandora's actor back into his place, Ainz had told him that he was lowering his importance to him. Should there come a time where he had to choose between a floor guardian or Pandora's actor, then Ainz made sure PA knew that he was the one who would be left behind. This didn't really carry with it the greatest feeling when Ainz had said it, but it was likely necessary to prevent the future spread of potential discord. Now, Ainz posting up an open view of every angle of the entire city did pose quite the issue to those who were supposed to be guarding him. Like, if Ainz was up against a sniper like Pararanchino, the position he was in right now would be his most vulnerable. Of course, Ainz's PvP training made him capable of defending against that, but there was still the possibility he could be attacked by something different. That being the case, Ainz knew he needed to be a bit more cautious until they figured out if they could resurrect a player. So long as the experiments on that remained incomplete, he knew he needed to act as if he had one life only. Thus the reason he went into town with the Horde of Angels. This wasn't the optimal shield that he desired, but as six level 80 gatekeepers summoned through the super tier spell pantheon, they were definitely enough to handle this stroll through the city. Ainz did consider several other options as well, but most were either not worth the cost that they carried to cast, or were simply too weak to even act as a shield. That said, he could have also used his Master of Dark Rites to strengthen his crate undead skill, but the near level 90 undead created from this would be way too strong. Like, he couldn't imagine walking through town with an eternal death whose passive literally caused insta-death and fear. That would definitely be one of the safer monsters to summon, but certainly not the right one for the audience he was trying to appeal to right now. Now, despite this next scene taking place at the end of the anime, it was for good reason supposed to happen before the guild meeting. As you'll soon find out, there was quite a bit of context left out towards Ainz's reasoning for his choice of future for his kingdom. So, the last scene in which Ainz declares his intent to build a utopia is an idea founded on the belief that his position is an extremely unique one. You see, even if a genius king went and made the perfect country, there was no guarantee that the kings to come after him would be perfect as well. If that genius king was somehow immortal and ageless though, then the perfect kingdom he built could theoretically persist forever. So long as the government was maintained by a small handful of geniuses as well, the immortal king would have no trouble overcoming anything. So, with Demiurge and Albedo right by Ainz's side, that made the Sorcerer Kingdom the only place capable of producing this eternal paradise. Every tool required to create a persistent utopia was right there in front of him waiting to be used by him. It was the perfect shape for world conquest that he could come up with, the path for his kingdom that he previously couldn't recognize. Demiurge and Albedo would rule the shadows by force, while he would rule in the open through overwhelming attraction. As for how he was going to do that, well, he began to approach the problem like it was a work project. If the kingdom was a company and he was the only employee, then the product was an ideal government and his job was now to sell it. It was a problem statement that brought with it two very basic marketing questions. Who in the world would want to purchase this product, and how would he go about letting them know that he's selling it? 
Those would be the final thoughts which would eventually lead Ainz right to the doorsteps of the Adventurer's Guild. I know this was a little bit out of order, but it really provides a lot more context as to why Ainz is going to the Guild in the first place. He was trying to find a way to reach the most people at once, all while showing them that the Sorcerer Kingdom could actually be pretty habitable. It's also why we see Ainz push so hard for the inclusion of all species here. But yeah, that's pretty much everything I got for Episode 1. And that's just the first of many Overlord videos that I have planned for this season. So, if you want to see more in-depth Overlord content, then be sure to subscribe so that you know when they come out next week. Oh, and in celebration of Season 4 having come out, I decided to bring back the Succubay shirts. So, if you never had the chance to get them back in Season 3, then you should definitely do so now before they're gone again. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!